Cool. Thank you, Lori. I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to share some of this data with you. Um, it's kind of the first time I've shown it. So I was really, really excited when Carol approached me about doing a webinar like this. Um, to start things off, I'm going to uh, get into um, kind of the nitty gritty details about using drones. So uh, drone basics, uh, those unmanned aircraft uh, rules that exist, um, it also examples of drone use on prescribed fires. And that's going to be where we get real specific on how we're using drones at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here in San Angelo um, to improve and enhance the overall education of prescribed burning at our burn schools. So we've hosted a uh, a burn school every year probably since 2016 or so maybe even 15 but here recently I've um, really started incorporating drones into the picture and the reason for that being is is so that when we have an after action review after the burn during our burn school we can go through and review that that drone data and imagery and really dissect the burn piece by piece. And so um, some of the feedback I was getting from my burn schools is like, oh, I really liked your, your, your burn school and participating on a burn, but I didn't get to see the head fire or I wasn't on the line on that flank fire. I was on the other side or all I was doing was, was black lining on, on the back fire side. And so, um, at these burn schools, I have anywhere from 100 to 150 people. And so it's kind of organized chaos. And I haven't really figured out an efficient way to get everyone um, the full picture view of what goes on during a burn and how you put these pieces of the box together in terms of, of lining out your, your lines. And so um, my solution or strategy was uh, using drones to film that burn as it was happening. Um, and so I've been hiring a contractor burn man or a contractor drone pilot to, to uh, fly the drone for me um, because I'm busy bossing the burn and, and uh, directing people. And uh, so it's, a, it's really cool to have this resource and know that that footage is being taken and know that I'm, um, hopefully enhancing the overall knowledge and understanding of what that burn looks like from a big picture bird's eye uh, point of view um, and just really in equipping all of these burn school participants with with what that burn looks like um, so Unmanned aerial system platform types, just getting into the basics. Um, I'm definitely no expert when it comes to this stuff. So um, I'm sure there's a lot more informed and educated folks about this. This is this is a, a range specialist perspective on the on the unmanned aerial systems, but uh, commonly fixed wing and rotary. Those are your your two basic choices. Uh, the fixed wing is definitely uh, more expensive, um, a little bit more top end. Um, but from what I've seen about a fixed wing, um, like the picture shown here, it's basically all styrofoam except for uh, the battery pack where the camera is and, and the actual mechanics in it. So it generates lift through the wings. Um, it has a longer endurance time. It generally is faster and more efficient for large areas. So given the longer endurance time, it can cover more land. Um, but you actually have to launch this. And I'll have a picture showing, showing a person throwing this up in the air. It really reminds me of a paper airplane to be honest with you. Now the rotary one, that, this is what I have. Um, I have yet to use a, a rotary on my, um, on my burns myself just because I'm so busy bossing the burn. Um, it's easier for me to hire a pilot who brings his own drone and he's able to fly it and get the footage that I need. But these rotary ones are pretty sweet. Um, they, I'm, I have no experience even playing video games. And so using a drone was a bit outside my comfort zone. Um, but I am learning more and more about it. Uh, the more I, um, I listen to, to researchers about it and the more I get to experience it. A lot of, um, a lot of work currently being done from Texas A&M AgriLife involves Dr. Megan Clayton, who's my counterpart and colleague in Corpus Christi, and she is doing a lot of drone work uh, looking at um, 
using drone imagery in terms of livestock production and, and how to how to encompass and incorporate that from a grazing management perspective. But back to this rotary UAS, uh, so it actually has lift by rotating its propellers rather than generating lift through the wings. Um, there's less pay payload, but definitely more flexible. Um, what I like about it is it, that it can actually hover and fly lower. And so it's, it's a little bit better option for inspections and higher resolution. So if you're looking to uh, gain an idea about a particular livestock water or tank or pond, um, you can definitely get a better feel for what that looks like uh, through the rotary. And I know some folks in Texas, they're even doing like wildlife census counts with this. So the ability to hover and fly lower is um, pretty beneficial official um, and it's it's a vertical takeoff and so there's a pretty neat feature on these uh, on these phantom threes where it's uh, you you have it uh, take off and land from the exact place and it's I think called a home button or something like that but um, a lot more features with this rotary type aircraft um, which might be more beneficial for not only prescribed burn practitioners but also livestock managers as well so the way uh, these drones work is they, they take photographs um, and they basically measure distances between objects and it's all in 3D. And so uh, drones um, are relatively new to the market, but they are revolutionary revolutioning eyes how we capture detailed geospatial data about objects and events on Earth. And so when we think about what Earth looks like and the, and the surface that we work on, um, the ability to take pictures and to um, really use photography in a more efficient and effective manner, um, especially from a fire sense, could be really, really meaningful. And a prime example of that is just the sheer resolution that's offered from a UAS system. So your typical Google Maps resolution is about 60 centimeters, and you can see that on the left of your screen. Um, but when we get into any type of drone uh, resolution, we can actually get it down to about four centimeters. So we have definitely higher resolution, and we're able to fly closer to the surface as well. So getting into some more details about the, the differences. Um, so for example, our fixed wing platform um, has an overall average endurance time of about 45 minutes. And that's um, quite a bit more than what we see with the rotary aircraft. Um, it's tremendously light it's like I said it's almost all styrofoam so it's only about a pound and a half weighs about a pound and a half it's a fully autonomous flight um, and it can fly up to 27 mile per hour winds um, it's able to maintain its trajectory and um, able to still fly in that in that flight plan um, the camera that is uh, usually paired up with a uh, uh, fixed wing aircraft um, are like the cameras that you see on the slide, the Canon um, 16 megapixel or a Canon 12 megapixel. It's my understanding that you have to buy these cameras separate in addition to your fixed wing aircraft. So that's just also something to keep in mind for, uh, for costs when, if you are looking into purchasing a drone. And so here's that picture where I was, I was saying that you literally have to launch this fixed wing um, platform aircraft. And again, um, it, it has to have quite a bit of horizontal room and it does need somebody to actually launch it. Whereas the rotary aircraft, um, you do not need anybody to launch it or put it into the air. Um, it actually generates itself vertically uh, due to the propellers on the plane. So here's kind of some comparisons between um, example uh, rotary platforms. So the Phantom 3 standard, I have the Phantom 3 professional um, 
like I said, I, uh, I, I typically don't fly mine on a prescribed burn. I hire somebody to do that for me. Um, but the Phantom 3 is, is pretty affordable, um, especially I know a lot of my prescribed burn association members, they're looking into getting the Phantom 3. The probably biggest limitation with this rotary um, platform is that it is only about 20 minutes flight time on your battery. And so if you're dealing and working within a large burn unit where you're covering a lot of ground, it might not be very efficient to, to use uh, this Phantom 3 um, to cover a burn unit of say even 500 acres. And so what some of my PBA folks are doing is they'll set up this, um, this Phantom 3 to just patrol certain lines of that burn unit because they know they're limited by the flight time that they can get out of it. But what's cool about the Phantom 3 is that it does come with a camera. Um, of course, there's different models that you can get, um, like the professional. It has a little bit higher quality camera. Um, and the Phantom 4 um, is definitely a higher, I guess, quality version of the Phantom 3, but um, you definitely pay for that too. So it's a little bit pricier, averaging anywhere from 12 to 1500. Um, another option is the 3DR Solo Drone, um, so this is a approximately $300. It does not come with a camera though, so a um, little bit different than what the Phantom offers. You still are limited by your flight time, approximately 20 minutes, um, but you can purchase that camera um, easily and, and set it up on what's called a gimbal. Um, so just some different options. Again, it all depends on <clears throat> on what you're trying to use it for and looking to use it for. Um, believe it or not, a lot of our prescribed burn associations in Texas, not only do the members own a drone, but the actual association is starting to own a drone as well. And so that drone um, is part of the shared equipment and resources that that PBA has. And so it will travel from fire to fire, just like say, for example, a drip torch. Um, what's really cool about those drones is, is that a lot of people, when I first started getting into it, I thought, oh my gosh, how could this be useful on a fire? Because I thought it was like a video game where you literally had to fly it. Um, but in all honesty, you can plan out a mission and you can put in specific GPS coordinates for that particular drone to fly. And um, like I said, some folks will will um, want to just patrol, say, the head fire side um, after that head fire's already went out there to determine any potential spots or escapes. Um, some folks will want to uh, patrol a flank fire if they've got, or an opposite flank fire if they've got more resources and more personnel on the other flank. Um, and so it's just really a cool way to program eyes and ears into that burn unit. So um, you as the prescribed burn manager or the burn boss know what's going on. Uh, a lot of the PBAs uh, that use these drones, they have designated pilots, right? So they went and got their license uh, to fly uh, these drones, to legally fly it. The drone is registered. They've went through all the laws and regulations to fly that drone. And so uh, the PBAs will have a designated drone pilot and that is his responsibility. In fact, it's even listed in the burn plan, which I think is pretty cool. So uh, there's other software programs that you can get that can help you plan out that mission. So this is an example of a flight plan with the GPS coordinates that were uh, put into the software. And so instead of looking at this um, urbanized area and thinking um, a flight plan, think about it in terms of a burn unit. And so um, this is pretty beneficial from not only a patrolling standpoint, um, but later on in the presentation, I'll share with you some, uh, some NIR and NDVI imagery uh, from the drones from using a flight plan just like this uh, that we were able to generate to determine uh, vegetation response to that prescribed burn. And again, these are all just educational resources and tools that we have at our um, 
at our fingertips to use during a burn school. And so uh, it's just to provide a bigger assessment and bigger picture view of what's going on um, at that fire that more folks can hopefully relate to. Uh, so throughout this mission planning software, you get to create an area to be mapped. You set the flying height and resolution. You get to define what type of skips and overlap exist. Um, and you're literally commanding and controlling it. So it's all real-time tracking um, and it's all uh, based off of a, of a GPS location that you've programmed into it. And basically what's happening when, when a drone flies this, um, this route that you have put into the software program, it's combining many different photographs into a single um, image. And so you're able to get a really unified picture of what that particular polygon, whether it's a burn unit or, um, or a pasture, to get a really unified uh, concise and a nice, clean, neat p uh, picture of what those vi visual images look like. What's also really cool too is that you can um, purchase software to use uh, in terms of uh, structure differences and so that's called a 3D point cloud. Um, this works really well for topography differences as well. Um, again, it's, it's flying a, a a route, a planned map basically that's provided by coordinates um, and then you're able to take those images and plug it into um, whatever area that you want to, to, to use it as an overlap or an overlay. Um, in some of the hill country areas, this has been pretty beneficial uh, for folks to really show the topography differences that, that can have an effect on that fire. Okay, I always like to function under the rule of better safe than sorry, and I figured I could not have a drone uh, presentation without talking about all the different rules that are involved with, uh, with manning these uh, aircraft systems or unmanned aircraft systems. So every, every drone owner is required by the FAA to register the drone um, if they weigh over um, half a pound or, or, or less, or less than 55 pounds. So the registration number must be marked on each drone, and that number is uniquely tied to the owner. And so you register once and you apply um, and it applies to all rules and regulations from the FAA. And so um, work or business aircrafts must be registered individually. Um, if you are using it as kind of a hobby purpose, which um, most of my prescribed burn association folks are doing, you do not need to have passed that 107 pilot test to register. You still are required to register your drone, but since you're using it as um, for a hobby use or recreational use, you're not required to register it. Now, the second you start charging uh, for those fires, um, or you are starting to operate under more of a commercial burn manager perspective, then that, that has a different definition and you would be required to take that 107 pilot test. So while you're flying, you have to have that certificate in possession. Um, Again, it doesn't have to be on your body, but in, in a pickup or, you know, somewhere close by, um, it, pretty important um, and I have I do not know all the specifics of the laws and the fines but I hear they are really really high and so I again better safe than sorry and so there's an online registration now available for all owner types and purposes and you can find that at the website listed here at registermyuas.faa.gov So flying for fun, again, this is kind of under that hobby uh, type scenario, which would be applicable to our prescribed burn associations. Again, you still have to register that drone. You still need a registration number, but there are no pilot requirements. Uh, you are required to stay five miles away from airports uh, without 
prior permission from airport and air traffic control. Uh, must always yield right away to manned aircrafts. And most importantly, you have to keep that drone within the line of sight, which I found with the battery time and the endurance time, it's pretty easy to keep that drone in sight because you are limited by about 20 minutes or so. Uh, you must follow community-based safety guidelines, so check with your county officials. Um, probably the more urbanized your county is, the more you're going to have guidelines or restrictions on this. Um, and there, then there's also an app called Before You Fly, and you can download that app to just kind of refresh uh, the laws and regulations as well as restrictions and requirements for operating a drone. I will say that once a prescribed burn transitions over to a wildfire and there's any type of incident command or unified command going on, that drone is now totally off limits. Um, and so absolutely no drones uh, to be flied in a wildfire type situation. So flying for a business, so commercially, so if a PBA starts charging for burning um, profits or burning for non-members, anything like that, um, it really starts to change the overall laws and regs associated with drones. And so this came into effect on August 29th, 2016. And so uh, you have to apply for a COA uh, certificate of authorization. And you also, or you uh, can pass the FAA Part 107 knowledge test. And that's um, kind of what I've been referring to uh, throughout this test or throughout this presentation. So the second you start, you know, collecting money or charging or doing anything for a profit, anything for a business, you do need that part 107 uh, test and the certificate showing you've taken that. There are some examples for students out there. Uh, so for example, student use for learning about the aircraft is considered recreational if you're doing it as part of a class. Um, a student paid for research, though, is likely not considered recreational um, because there is some type of exchange of um, money going on in that situation and even a faculty or staff member operating a UAV as part of their job is not considered recreational. So that part 107 test from the FAA is um, absolutely critical if you are doing any of this related to your job. A lot of this is um, again a bit overwhelming and so um, that's partly why I have chosen to hire a contractor a drone operator because all of this is, is something that I'm just able to kind of skip over because he has his pilot's license. He's able to fly all of that. He's registered. He's um, legally able to do that. And he also puts together nice videos for me as well that I can use in my classroom. So getting more into that Part 107 rule, you must be at least 16 years of age. Uh, you have to pass the knowledge test, which is good for two years. Um, you have to take it at an FAA approved testing center um, and also be vetted by the TSA. So there are still operating rules even after you've taken the uh, this 107 test. Um, those consist of flying in class G airspace, and I'll have a figure that shows uh, more of that here in a little bit. Uh, you have to keep that aircraft in sight. Again, even similar to what those hobby or recreational users uh, fly under in terms of regulations. With that class G airspace, you're required to fly under 400 feet um, to fly during the day and fly at or below 100 miles per hour. Again, yielding right of ways to manned aircrafts and not flying over people and not flying from a moving vehicle. So there is some common sense that goes along with this, um, but I would encourage you, if you are thinking about pursuing this, um, download that app before you fly to really make sure you've crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's. So that part 107 knowledge test looks a bit like this. And when I finally saw what was on this test, I just got really overwhelmed by it. And so um, I actually 
paid a third party to provide an online training session that walked me through all the all the specifics of what this test encompasses um, and so the knowledge test you have to know all of those regulations relating to small and un unmanned aircraft systems privileges limitations flight operations you have to know what that airspace classification looks like and how to define it and also uh, again all those flight restrictions um, affecting the UAS uh, you also have to be aware of aviation weather um, and effects of weather on small unmanned aircraft performance uh, Keep in mind the payload, uh, the aircraft loading and performance, emergency procedures, crew resource management, radio communication procedures, determining the performance of small and mountain aircrafts, um, and then air, general airport operations, and also maintenance and pre-flight inspection procedures. So it's a pretty intensive test, um, but again, it's, it's an absolute requirement if you're going to be doing anything related to commercial or profit with your drone. So this is what that airspace looks like. Uh, you, as a drone operator, you're required to fly in Class G airspace, so 400 feet or uh, lower. Uh, there are definite restrictions, so any type of military operations, controlled firing areas, uh, stadiums and sporting events one hour before and after within three miles. Uh, and here we get into the wildfire fight firefighting operations so as soon as that prescribed burn transitions over to a wildfire incident the drones got to be shut down it, it, it just cannot be up in the air when there's a, a wildfire suppression uh, tactics going on and airports within five miles okay so following a prescribed burn this is where where i've seen um the most benefit from drones and so what typically goes down in one of my burn schools is um we'll spend a couple of days in the classroom um talking about the basics pretty much uh, what you would typically find in any type of learn and burn or burn school situation um but then we actually get out in the field and we assign, like I said, even from 100 to even 150 participants, we assign, we break down that big of a group down into kind of squad boss sizes. So I try to limit my teams to maybe 10 people or less. Each team has a, has a de designated squad boss or leader um, and there's one torch for that team. And so they'll get assigned to either, you know, uh, black lining on the, on the backfire side, on flank sides, or um, maybe they're staged and ready for holding resources or staged and ready to be the head fire team when that comes into play. So it's, it's a fairly orchestrated, organized chaos type situation. Um, but it's, like I said, it's limited in what jobs you get to experience and really observe. And so after that burn, we'll show the video footage and we'll go through an after action review just like an NWCG uh, incident or just like a wildfire incident. We'll talk about what was planned. And so we'll, that's when we will review the burn plan and we'll look at that ignition sequence and say, well, this was supposed to happen, blah, blah, blah. Then we get to what actually happened. And this is when that drone footage comes up on the big screen um, and we're able to sit there and play it, pause it, uh, go backwards, forwards with it, whatever. And we see not only um, that ignition sequence, but we also get to observe fire behavior, fire intensity, fire effects on a plant community that probably, you know, has um, participants have very minimal or little experience with and then we just go right through that AAR uh, what did it what you know why did it happen um, and it's really pretty cool to show um, why there's differences in, in consumption as well so we get to talk about everything we learned in the classroom the few days prior to so fuel moisture soil moisture uh, topography everything related to 
how a fire burns and why is it burning. And also what's really been cool is you can actually tell in that drone footage when the sun has been, a, when, when clouds have passed over and when we've got open sun out on, on our fuel and what difference that has in our fire behavior. Um, and then also we end up with what can we do different next time? And so uh, not only do I play that, that drone video footage from that day, I'll show my previous burn schools footage as well because I think every burn you participate on, you should be learning something. And so the more um, kind of in-person experience I can give them related to fire, the more confident I'm going to feel that they walked away from my burn school knowing something and having way more experience underneath their belt had I just showed them or versus just having them out in the field on one particular burn. Okay, so uh, the next slide, we're gonna show those videos from the drones. Um, uh, it, they're about three minutes long or so, uh, but again, watch this drone footage and think about it in the context of an AAR and how helpful that could potentially be. So this was in 2016, but this is probably one of the first drone videos I did. Uh, the pilot that I work with, he's really, really good on also putting together these videos. And so he's able to take a picture of the burn plan, showing the burn map, showing the sequence, showing a wind direction. Um, and then he's able to put some titles on it so folks can really get an idea of, of the backfire. This uh, first video that I did, this wasn't a part of a burn school. Uh, this was actually just filming a uh, commercial burn team uh, because I felt like when I was in the classroom explaining how a ring fire ignition sequence went down and the differences between a backing fire versus a head fire, uh, I was just looking at blank faces and blank stares. And so when I was able to show this video in my county programs or in my, my future burn schools, um, I really started to see uh, folks connecting the dots and realizing that this is how this fire is going to pull together. And this is why we burned it the way that we did given the wind direction and the fuel topography. It's also really helpful, too, for them to see the different sequence and the staggered torches, too. You know, why do we have three torches out there versus only one torch? Or why is somebody on a four-wheeler? Um, again, this is a great opportunity to have uh, conversations about, uh, you know, burning current year's growth and why we need some dry, dead previous year's growth in there to help carry out this fire. Uh, with a drone, too, and a, and a talented pilot, you're able to also get a really clear visual of smoke. And so you can have a really cool conversations about smoke management. Um, which way is that smoke going? Is it going away from our smoke-sensitive areas? Um, you know, is it is it going the way that was forecasted in the smoke model? Um, so while we're reviewing all of this, we get to have that burn plan in front of us. We have the printed weather, fire weather out too, and we're putting it together as a concise picture of a burn, um, and and everybody gets to experience it too. And so uh, again, this was a. Uh, my first video that I filmed, um, but I, I felt it was pretty advantageous to show them how that ring fire uh, pulls together. In Texas, we have a lot of conversations with landowners about uh, wildlife, and everybody is kind of, a lot of landowners um, are just wary of what type of uh, environment you're creating for your wildlife in terms of escape and, and what's going to happen if you do do a ring fire um, ignition sequence. So with this, we can show them, okay, this is how that ring fire sequence goes down, but then we can also show them how a strip fire sequence would go down and how we can control what areas are burned and how that fire is burning throughout the, the burn unit. Um, 
and so my my uh, videographer and drone pilot he's able to really put down some specifics of ignition complete um, and also really outlining hey this is a backing fire this is a flank fire and then this is a head fire um, and so that's just a a video that we are able to review um, if I know I'm doing a ring fire sequence uh, ignition sequence in my one of my burn schools I will show this video prior to so I can tell people what to expect and this is how this is gonna go down okay uh, we will move on to our next video okay this is from 2017 um, this is a uh, summer prescribed burn. This is probably one of my bigger burn schools. I had probably about 150 people um, and all different types of um, experience came to this burn school. I had um, several county commissioners, county officials, county judges. Uh, I also had a lot of volunteer fire department folks and a lot of county extension agents. Um, folks that are able to check any of those boxes automatically get a comp registration. So I don't charge them when they come to my burn school just because it's that important to me that we are able to build a fire culture. And again, the more burns, the more experience somebody can have on a fire uh, the better off we're going to be in terms of promoting that fire culture and so uh, so this starts out um, as you can see a kind of a big assessment aerial view of what the of what the um, burn unit looked like I always try to show a video footage of the briefing taking place because I think that's a really really important step again I want I want somebody to be able to watch this three minute video, whether it's at my burn school or um, in a classroom or on the internet, whatever, and get a feel for the steps that go on during that burn. So you can see all the different burn teams um, that's uh, being showed on this, on this burn unit. Uh, I probably get the most, um, I guess hits or views off of this particular burn video because this is very much a growing season burn. Um, but people, and especially in Texas, a lot of folks get so worried about uh, volatility and intensity of a summer burn. They automatically think it's going to be off to the races and turn into a wildfire. So this this footage is so key to showing folks the differences in, in seasons of burn and just because it's done during one of the hottest months in Texas does not mean that we're going to have a really hot and intense fire on our hands and so if I show this to a group of folks who have had little or minimal fire experience they're like whoa I had no idea it would burn like that especially in July um, and so the videographer, you can also tell that he's able to speed things up, slow things down to really build a, a full effect of that fire. Um, the other cool thing about this video is our backing fire. It took so long to march 150 people down a line that our backing fire almost burned through the entire unit before we were able to light the head fire. Um, and so that's also pretty powerful for folks to see just um, how quickly and how um, smoothly a backfire can maneuver itself through a burn unit, especially if it's a if it's a burn association that's operating with limited resources or limited personnel too. So this burn unit was about 300 acres. Again, you can start to see a little bit more fire activity as the day went on. We started this burn we started ignitions probably around 8 a.m. or so again we were dealing with a lot of green grass too so things were a bit slow um, but folks were able to see uh, how things transitioned as the day went on so the sun came out humidities went down wind picked up a little bit what's also really cool about this this video is you can see that there's a pretty busy county road off in the foreground um, and then of course what a perfect way to show smoke moving away from that really busily busy heavily trafficked county road area and so um, again another way to describe how we can safely safely put 
put fire uh, in the manner of prescribed burning on the landscape. And uh, again, these videos are just really, really helpful for folks who've never seen fire before. They've, they've got, when you bring up fire in their world, they're immediately thinking of uh, California or the Bastrop fire from 2011 or our Texas Panhandle fires from 2017. So it's really, really cool to showcase what fire looks like from a prescribed burning definition. Okay. Okay, so uh, I know some of you are probably really familiar with uh, using uh, drone imagery, specifically NIR and NDVI, but from this burn uh, unit that we had in 2017 that the last video was played off of, we also had a second drone who, who, was, who was flying it and taking these images. And so, uh, these are these are images of uh, examples of color on the far left that that would be your uh, red green blue or RGB near infrared which is your NIR image and the normalized difference vegetative index or NDVI on your far right and so all of these images are in a cropping system obviously but they were all captured with a rotary platform small uh, unmanned aerial system. And what I wanted to show with this is that, uh, you know, instead of thinking about it in terms of a cropping system, thinking about, think about using this type of technology from a prescribed burning standpoint and just the power in these photos and visual aids when you're talking to a group of burn school participants or a group of ranchers who are contemplating starting a prescribed burn association. I think um, an image is worth a thousand words and so a lot of times I can't adequately describe it, but if I can put a picture up and showcase the power of technology and ways to assess our plant communities before and after a prescribed burn, uh, then that is always worth its weight in gold. And so I took, I took these NIR and NDVI and also the RGB images uh, on that burn unit that you just saw. And so this is what the RGB uh, imagery looked like before fire. And again, RGB or color imagery is very similar to viewing a digital photograph taken from a plane. Um, it's basically what you would see with your naked eye. And so with this drone technology and with the pilot, I had a pilot filming it for um, a, a pure educational standpoint who is gonna be doing the videography of it all. And then I also had another pilot who was flying it for these types of images. And then this is what that RGB of picture looked like following the fire. So all of these were flown the day of uh, one hour to ignition and then uh, it was all flown I think probably one hour after ignition. Okay now this is getting into that near uh, excuse me, the normalized difference vegetation index or the NDVI. Um, this is just a, a pretty powerful way of showcasing um, areas that have, have uh, areas from that burn unit that have went through um, any type of plant stress or um, anything where there's a, a measurable difference uh, between that vegetation. So a color gradient is, is always applied with these maps. A commonly used gradient is uh, red to green, red being the low values and green being the high. Um, and typically four colors are used uh, representing these types of images. Um, again, these are usually calibrated images to, uh, to be used to show changes in vegetation due to any type of management. Uh, some folks will use this uh, following any type of grazing or even mechanical. Um, but again, I think there's a lot of power in it uh, using it from a prescribed burning perspective. And so, uh, again, just another way to assess and describe how that prescribed burn went through uh, this burn unit. And again, these images are all readily available immediately after that burn school. So um, what typically happens is I've, I've, uh, I've got folks who, um, who uh, you know, 
leave the burn, they'll grab a bite to eat, they'll kind of sit and gather and talk about what they experienced. And then by the time my videographer and other drone pilot has all these images compiled, I'm ready to showcase them to the burn school who, who just lit the fire themselves. Okay, and so looking at the, the NIR imagery, uh, again, near-infrared imagery provides a, a, an assessment of plant health uh, rather than those traditional photos using of just uh, the RGB images. Um, the NIR Im uh, images visualize color bands outside of what that human eye can see. And this is what that one looked like after the fire. Okay, this will be my last video um, to show. Uh, this is our most recent prescribed burn school. Um, this was a really interesting burn school because it was forecasted in September, uh, early September, and um, we'd been so dry in Texas during the summer and August that um, I thought this was the perfect unit for, for a burn school. Um, unfortunate, well, I guess fortunately, we uh, started getting a lot of rain and it hasn't stopped since then. So this burn unit was not as, um, as dry as I would like it to be. And unfortunately, there wasn't that much residual forage from previous year's growth. Um, and so it just was a really, really, green unit um, and even though it was in September it was very much a growing season burn um, so with this particular video uh, again using it as an educational uh, perspective I was able to put a lot more uh, words to the to the footage to the video to really paint a picture of what a growing season burn uh, looked like So again, showing the, the briefing of all of our, uh, of our burn school participants. Uh, given how much rain we had, uh, so for example, we probably had 10 inches on this unit prior to the burn school within like a week. And uh, so I had a lot of folks kind of back out of doing this burn, but you can see how, how green it was. And again, all of it was, was pretty much current year's growth that responded to the rainfall. Again, I took it upon myself to use this as an educational tool. Again, every, every fire that you're on, you should be able to learn something from it. And so um, I, I took this as an opportunity to, to really showcase what it would be like burning, burning during a, a really above average wet season. Um, and this, this burn was in San Angelo. Uh, this was at our Texas A&M AgriLife Research Center. Um, it was mostly Klein grass. And as you can see, this burn unit had been previously grubbed and so, uh, and then seeded as a Klein grass field. So it wasn't a native plant community by any means, um, but still pretty beneficial for folks to, to implement a burn in. So this video uh, was put together immediately after the burn school. Um, all of our burn participants ate, they came in off the burn, they ate lunch, and while they were eating lunch, the pilot and videographer were putting together these, these videos. Um, and about an hour later, we started the AAR, where we highlighted uh, this, this video footage. And I also shared my other, my other videos as well. And so you can kind of tell when, when the pilot pauses it and, um, but I've worked with the same pilot for uh, the last three or four years now. And so he knows what I'm trying to get um, off of these videos. He want, he knows that I'm, I always try to work with, try to showcase the smoke, um, try to showcase the fire breaks or fire guards that you see there. Um, and, and really just try to paint a very clear picture of all the steps that happen from A to Z.
Okay, so now that we've looked at those videos, again, think about it in terms of an AAR. What was planned? What actually happened? Why did it happen? That last video that we saw, uh, it was really crappy consumption and none of my black pulled together. But again, I think it was very worthwhile to see, uh, to showcase to those burn school participants of, of, of why didn't it burn? Um, just because it wasn't the... Um, effect that we were going for. I still think that there's a lot of power in learning from it and um, and and being able to show uh, how important um, all of those parameters of the burn plan are when you actually are reviewing and seeing that burn as it takes place. So they'll have their burn plan in front of them, they'll have the weather in front of them, and then they get to watch this drone video on a screen. So start to finish, it can be pretty meaningful and important in enhancing their overall knowledge and an understanding. And so that's all I've got for you today. Um, uh, you can, if you have any questions, you can always email me at morgan.treadwell at tamu.edu. Um, I put a lot of my burn um, information and stuff up on West Texas Rangelands on my Facebook site. And then also I'm on Twitter at ex. Morgan Russell. So feel free to follow me anywhere there. And uh, I didn't notice any questions. Um, Lori, by chance, did you see any, any questions that came up? Nope. But does anybody have any questions before we close out of here? Okay, seeing none, just a reminder, that this recorded will be up on our YouTube channel, that's GP Fire Science, and on our website, gpfirescience.org. So I just wanna thank you again, Morgan, for a great presentation, and um, I think it's gonna get a lot of use when we get it posted. A lot of people are gonna be visiting it. So thanks again, and everybody have a great day. Cool, thank you, Lori, I really appreciate it.